this case, which I showed you earlier, done the same year in 1990, the implant was placed slightly to the palate, and here is a 15-year follow-up of that same patient. Notice that there is no recession at 15 years on the implant in the area tooth number 9, due primarily to the amount of bone in the biotype of the patient, secondarily to the position. The implant is too far labial. Good chance you're going to develop recession. In this case, which is a relatively simple case, the kind of case that we see routinely in our practice where we have a single failing central, it seems like we have a lot of patients with single failing anterior teeth. These are challenging cases, but they can be done relatively predictably if you follow certain rules. My recommendation is that you take your time when you're doing these cases. Don't rush them. Don't go for immediate this, immediate that, immediate that. We tend to be in a rush today. Everything's fast, fast, fast. That's okay if you know what you're doing and you select the cases properly. However, if you're in early in your early curve or if you want to be very predictable, take it slow. In this case, we have a very, very vain patient, a patient with high cosmetic demands who wants things to be perfect. She's an artist and she travels a long way to come for care. She has an abscess associated with tooth number nine. Step one, take out the tooth, clean out the infection, graft it in this case with freeze-dried bone and a collagen plug, allow her to heal. And this is our routine that we do if the labial plate is present. Socket provision, you know, preserve the socket, preserve the site for future implant placement, degranulate it well. And at one week, she looks like this. Twelve weeks post-extraction, she's healed, and we're going to go ahead and place her implant. The implant is placed ideally, which would be slightly, slightly distal, so that we pick up the gingival zenith, slightly palatal to the palatal line angles of the central and lateral incisors, and three to four millimeters from the resultant dental gingival junction. We want to place the implant platform three millimeters from where it was going to emerge from the gingiva. We also like to have about three to four millimeters of bone labial to the implant as described by Grunder so as to support the soft tissue and help regenerate and support some of the papilla. So this would be an ideal case. Second stage surgery prevents, presents an opportunity to increase the amount of soft tissue and also to get proper abutment seating, control of thickness, ridge contour, etc. I like second stage surgery as a routine for implants placed in the aesthetic zone. So in our practice, almost all the implants we do in the aesthetic zone are done as a two-stage procedure. Implant placement, followed by healing, followed by implant exposure. Because during implant exposure, we have an opportunity to increase soft tissue which is the name of the game in the aesthetic zone. There are a number of approaches we have. One of the approaches that we often use is a palatal approach or a roll technique, as described by Lenny Abrams, where we make an incision from line angle to line angle palatally on the adjacent teeth, push the tissue toward the labial, and cover our implant and place a temporary healing above it, as you can see in this picture. Two simple interrupted sutures are placed, and we allow the patient to heal for three to four weeks, and then a provisional is placed. That three to four weeks of healing is important to allow for soft tissue maturation. If a provisional is placed on today, you can still get good soft tissue maturation if it's done properly. However, in a busy referral practice where a lot of dentists aren't that comfortable making provisionals, I want to make sure that the tissue is matured prior to them provisionalizing it. It will leave more room for error and not allow soft tissue to recede as much if the provisional is not made ideally. This way it gives me a little bit more control to idealize soft tissue before the provisional. Four weeks later, soft tissue has healed and a longer butt will be placed. We did something in this case called guided gingival growth where, this, where the temporary healing button was placed slightly beneath the soft tissue, allowing the soft tissue to heal over the abutment. This is a technique I learned from James Stein, the prosthodontist, who's in Boston. So, here we are. Implant has been uncovered, provisional abutment, or, or permanent abutment has been placed, and a provisional restoration. In this case, we use the gold Chinjiu abutment made by Independent Innovations. Oftentimes, we'll use a you know, performance cylinder or temporary component to make our provisional. If you look at this photograph, you can see that the soft tissue is starting to mature. We don't have complete papillary reformation distal 
but is getting there. Here's the provisional at two weeks. Villas are starting to reform, but they're not there completely, especially in the distal. Patient at eight weeks. Villas are completely reformed. Soft tissue profile is nice. We have good soft tissue labial to the, to the tooth, to the implant. And we're going to go ahead and do the final. So about four weeks later, we go ahead to the final restoration. If you look at the final restoration, there's very little change between the final crown and the original crown. Final crown is a little shorter than the adjacent crown, but there may be some recession. And the hallmark of some of our early restorations, the ones that we do, is that there's excess soft tissue around the implant. If you look at the implant on tooth number nine on your right, you'll see that there's more soft tissue on the implant than the adjacent tooth. If we want, we can do a gingivectomy, providing that we've got porcelain limiting the gingiva, that the implant is deep enough, which it is, or we can allow for that one millimeter of soft tissue recession that we normally see during the first year following implant restoration. Here's the tooth. You can see the abscess. And here's the implant. No abscess. No difference in soft tissue. A very simple case, an ideal result, because we took our time. Extraction bone graft, three months of healing. Implant placement, three months of healing. Implant exposure, one month of healing. Provisionalization, three months. Total time, 11 months. Start to finish. In order to be most predictable, I find it's sometimes often better to be more conservative, especially early on in your learning curve. Yes, we can take out a tooth and we can place an implant and we can place a provisional and do a non-immediate load and allow that to heal for a few months and then go to our final. But what if the implant fails? What if you have soft tissue loss? Do you have an opportunity to recapture the soft tissue without having to do more surgery? So in inexperienced hands, those techniques require a lot of experience. So if you go early on in your curve, my recommendation is take it slow and let things heal. Patients don't want to wear a removable. You can bond on a tooth. You can do a Maryland bridge as a provisional. There's a lot of things you can do. The third area, we've covered mesial distal, keeping them slightly distal. We've covered buccal palatal, slightly palatal. Let's talk about apical coronal. I like to keep the implants about three to four millimeters from the resultant gingival margin, free gingival margin, or CEJ. Deep restorations are difficult to clean or remove the cement. Shallow weight restorations are worse because you can show the implant. If you show the implant aesthetically, it's something that you really can't do much about. Dropping the implants three to four millimeters allows the development of soft tissue by creating what we call running room. This is a case I treated, again, about 20 years ago. And you can see that the implant is way too deep. No bone grafting was done. No gingival grafting was done. No forced eruption. The implant was placed where the bone is. Because of that, as you can see in the lower left, we have a long crown. There's been an attempt at regrowing some gingiva with gingival grafting that didn't work. The only good thing about this is that when the patient smiled, it didn't show anything. So if you're going to make a mistake, make it on someone that when they smile broadly, don't show the gingiva. In this case, the curtain of his lip in the stage where the teeth were. But the implant was placed too deep. If he had a high smile line, this could be a disaster. This is another disaster. This is a patient that had an implant placed in the area of the upper left canine. Uh, my recommendation to the patient was to take out the tooth and to graft it and to allow it to heal. The patient decided she didn't want it like that treatment and she wanted it done more immediately. She went to see someone who took out the tooth. Labial plate was lost during extraction and the surgeon went ahead and placed the implant where the bone was. In this case, a 5 millimeter implant placed deep. Now to fix this would require implant removal, soft tissue grafting, bone grafting. Very difficult. My recommendation to the patient was to uh, I did not want to get involved with it at this point because it's a difficult situation to very challenging to, to retreat and I'd already offered her a solution prior to having it replaced. If you try to remove the 5 millimeter implant in the canine, you can be removing probably most of the buckle and some of the palatal bone 
have a large reconstruction. I couldn't guarantee her I could make this better. Uh, she elected to leave it alone. It just comes in now for recall. But the 5 millimeter implants in the aesthetic zone, you have more recession. Okay? Especially if someone with very thin labial plate. In her case, she doesn't even have any keratinized tissue around the implant. It's going to probably cause more recession. I recommended that we bury the implant, allow the soft tissue to heal a little bit, do a connective tissue graft, and maybe redo the crown, something conservative like that. But she's elected to leave it. This could have been avoided, though, with a staged approach. Extraction, bone grafting, healing, implant placement, healing, implant exposure. So today, for me, who, someone who's been doing implants for close to 25 years, my pendulum is more the conservative court. Talk to me in six months, I may be more radical, but right now, I'm relatively conservative. This is one of my patients. The patient has internal and external root resorption, as you can see from the x-ray. Only about 10 millimeters of bone present beneath the sinus. When this tooth comes out, we may lose a lot of bone. Because this tooth is ankylosed. By the time I took the tooth out, this is the day of extraction. You can see we're going to have a soft tissue problem. We're going to have a longer tooth. We're going to be left with a defect, as you can see. Three months post-extraction, the patient has lost four to five millimeters of bone. It only has about five to six millimeters of bone beneath the sinus. I could have placed an implant in, lifted the sinus, or we could regenerate the bone. So now we need vertical regeneration if we're going to have a not want to leave it with a long canine. So we reflected the area, and you can see that we have about five to six millimeters of vertical loss of bone, plus a fairly large amount of bone loss mesial distally as well. Choices for this include block grafting, guided bone regeneration, utilizing uh, resorbable membranes with screws, guided bone regeneration, utilizing titanium reinforced score. Uh, you can go in here, here with BMP, titanium mesh, a number of different types of growth factors that are available today we elected to do was to place a bone graft top of the area, freeze-dried bone allograft, in growth factors with autogenous bone, and cover it with a cortex membrane, titanium reinforced, that was stabilized with two titanium tacks labially, stabilized on the palate with a Gore-Tex suture. So here's the membrane in place. And we had to place another vertical mesial to the lateral incisor. As you can see, we have two verticals there. To reposition the soft tissue so that we had primary coverage over the membrane. One of the problems with Gore-Tex is those of you who know who use it is that if it becomes exposed, it gets infected, you have to remove it. If you have an infection subgingivally because of the acidotic nature of the infection, you're going to lose bone and it's a mess. The Gore-Tex becomes sloppy and messy. You have to lay a flap, remove it. You may lose bone because of your graft. So that's one of the downsides of Gore-Tex. One of the upsides is it's one of the best research materials that we have today on the market. It does work when it stays covered. In our practice, we use it occasionally for vertical augmentation. That's mostly what we use it for today. We also have other techniques, including tenting screws uh, with, with other membranes. Uh, I don't do block grafts anymore. So I'm doing more guided bone regeneration for this. Um, and our exposure rate is in the single digits, but that's still high. When those becomes exposed, it's a problem. Here we are at six months. Vortex is still present, and you have that pink white shine showing that it's pretty healthy. The vortex is removed. You can see the bone in price. Go ahead and place our implant at this point. Time the day of vortex removal. What you can see will be four in the left and after the right. The implant is placed. Straightforward, and we allow that to heal. Another procedure that we often use in second stage surgery is something called guided gingival growth. Guided gingival growth is a technique that was developed by Dr. James Stein, and I believe we ever published it. He shared it with me about 15 years ago at a study club meeting. And what he uh, told me back in 1994 was that he's able to non surgically grow gingiva over titanium abutments. What he did was he placed a titanium abutment onto the implant and placed a provisional restoration short of the gingiva. And he let the soft tissue slowly grow up the titanium abutment. What I did, and what I did took from his concept, was I started using temporary healing abutments and burying them slightly below the gingiva, but not completely. 
letting the soft tissue grow over the temporary healing department. And I'll place a set of them, let the soft tissue heal, and come back a few weeks later and place a longer abutment. But here's the same patient six weeks later with a little bit more soft tissue over the abutment. You notice the one on the right is completely covered. The one on the left is partially covered. This time I'll place a longer temporary healing abutment. Go back to place provisional. Here's their left side the day of abutment placement and the right side six weeks later. Longer abutments are placed. The patient is placed into provisional restoration for six to eight weeks. Here's the uh, lower right. is the six weeks post-provisionalization. Uh, We're going to wait another few weeks before we go to the final. You can see that the papillas are starting to mature, as you can see around the abutments right above the uh, provisional on the right side of your screen. Here's the final restoration. Not ideal, but more soft tissue than if we did not regenerate a lot of the soft tissue in that area. Now, I found with adjacent implants, it's very difficult to regenerate a lot of soft tissue when surgery is done filling the flaps. The only way that I've been able to predictably keep the papillas is by extracting the teeth, placing the implants immediately, or visualizing. So that is one indication in our practice for immediate extractions, immediate placement, and immediate provisionalization. It's when you have adjacent teeth, usually eight and nine. But it has to be a case with a thick biotype without a lot of periodontal infection. In this case, we had other problems because the patient had resorption, both external and internally, lost a lot of bone, and the bone had to be regenerated. Now, if I can go back to that patient with the vertical ridge augmentation, this is what she looked like the day of second stage surgery. You can see we still have some loss of soft tissue on the upper left. On the right side, made a sulcular incision of the adjacent teeth, carried the incision palatally, placed a temporary healing abutment, and place two sutures. We left the soft tissue slightly away from the palatal tissue, so there's a gap from the buccal to palatal tissue. We let this area granulate in. And here she is three weeks post second stage surgery. You can see the soft tissue is almost touching the opposing arch. The canine is almost touching the soft tissue that we regenerated over the temporary healing abutment. And you can see the temporary healing abutment on the right side peeking through. But this time we just remove a little soft tissue, place a longer abutment onto this area, and we can go ahead and take our impression for provisional restoration. So we have good bone regeneration, we have good soft tissue regeneration, both critical, and the implant is placed in ideal position. So in this case, we placed a ENCODE abutment, which is a proprietary abutment, CAD CAM abutment made by Implant Innovations. And we'll go ahead and take an impression of that abutment, make a provisional restoration. And here's the final restoration. This is a picture of the provisional restoration in place. And a comparison of before and after, seeing that we were able to regenerate a good five to six millimeters of vertical bone and soft tissue so that we could have ideal restoration. The patient was informed of all this before extraction, not after. If you inform a patient before you do the treatment, it's informed consent. If you inform a patient afterwards, you're making an excuse. So we try to inform the patient that's going to take some time, multiple surgical procedures up front. One of the things I've learned over the last few years of doing this is to be, we can't be completely predictable in what we do, but we can be completely upfront in what the risks are. And it's important to share those with patients. The last aspect I want to talk about in terms of position is what we call running room. This is a technique, or a, a, not a technique, but a, a phrase uh, coined by Dr. Steve Potashnik, a prosthodontist from Chicago. And what he described is that we go from two different size diameters. We go from the diameter of the platform of the implant to the diameter of the CEJ. Now, in this case, for a central incisor, we're going from usually a 4 millimeter platform maybe a 7 to 8 millimeter CEJ diameter. So we're going from two different circles. We're going from a small circle to a large circle. And the distance between those circles is called running room. That's where we transition from a 4 millimeter to a 7 or 8 millimeter circle. You want that transition to be smooth. You want it to be confluent. You don't want to have any undercuts. Because you want to be able to support the volume of that tissue. You also want to make it cleansable. 
So if it's a nice smooth contour, as shown in this photograph from, uh, I believe this is Steve Farrell's and Dan Sullivan's book published many, many years ago. You have a nice smooth transfer from one circle to the other. You don't get plaque into that area. And you also support the soft tissue. <coughs> Excuse me. And this is the three to four millimeters of running room. In this photograph, you can see this is nice. This is the 15-year follow-up I showed you earlier where we have a nice smooth transfer from the 4 millimeter circle to the 8 millimeter circle. That soft. That is the nice amount of running room that was done perfectly. We did this case 20 years ago before any of these articles were published. We didn't know what we were doing right or wrong. We just happened to get it right in this case. I've shown you other cases from 20 years ago that weren't ideal. Where your implants were placed inappropriately. This one was happened to be done perfectly. Just by luck. Uh, by looking at our cases over 20 years, over 15 years, we see what we did right, we see what we did wrong. In this case, this is something that was done perfectly, and we have a nice result 15 years later. If I can summarize, it's important to idealize the implant position. In order to idealize the implant position, you need to have adequate quantity and quality of bone. So site preservation Site regeneration, site development is of paramount importance if we're going to go ahead and place implants ideally. If the bone is there, the next thing that we need to do is idealize the position of the implant. If we don't have an ideal position, we will not have an ideal restoration. Bone regeneration first. Minimum of 1.5 millimeters of implant to tooth distance, I prefer two. Minimum of three millimeters from between implants, I prefer four. Angle the implant slightly palatal to the size of that angle for cemented restorations and through the cingulum for screw retained. The implant platform should be three to four millimeters from the dental gingival junction or the CEJ or the what will become the CEJ when the implant emerges through the soft tissue. And second stage surgery is a second opportunity for gingival growth, either with guided gingival growth, different flap designs, soft tissue positions, etc. If you'd like more information on some of the articles that we've published, if you go to our website, uh, www.sonicdmd.com, we have probably 25 articles that our practice has written over the last uh, two decades on a lot of these concepts. You can download all of them as PDFs. Uh, we also have further courses that you can have, both hands-on, live surgical courses, guided bone regeneration, kind of tissue grafting. Uh, we have one coming up. Our next one will be in the uh, spring, bone grafting. We also have a course coming up, a hands-on course down at Dell XP, in November of this year, on both hard and soft tissue uh, regeneration. Uh, at this point in time, uh, if you have any questions, please just type them in. I'll take a few minutes to answer some of your questions online. Again, I'd like to thank our sponsor, Densefly and Tenel XP, for the opportunity to spend some time with you and have a great weekend. Thank you very much.